Hi, and welcome to the first of our new Disleek training videos. Now, in this video, we're just kind of going to basically introduce ourselves and tell you what Disleek is, who Disleek is, and what it is that we do. Now, when we do any of our training courses, when we start any of our training courses, we normally start off with this slide where we ask people to introduce themselves and tell, them, uh, tell us a little bit about themselves, where do they come from, uh, what their background is, and so forth. Now, obviously, with an online training presentation, this is kind of pointless and kind of difficult. So why do I even discuss this? The thing is that home distilling and potentially craft distilling is not something that's limited to people that only have a science background. There's a, very, uh, a quote from Bill Owens from the American Distilling Institute, where he says that the only thing that craft distillers actually have in common is that none of them have a background in craft distilling. Home distilling is something that is available to anybody. Anybody can learn how to do it. Anybody can learn how to do it correctly. Anybody can make a good product. I'm not saying it's easy, but it is possible if you have the right information, if you have the right training. And that's what we're going to try to do here, is we're going to share that information with you so that you are able to distill a quality product at home. Make a fermentation, distill it, and turn it into something drinkable. If in future you then decide you want to go craft, you actually want to go commercial, that is a possibility as well. But it still won't be easy. It is possible, but it's not easy. So if you're here and if you're looking at this video thinking this is an easy way to make money, it's an easy business to get into, it's easy to make good products, no. It's not easy, but it is possible. So who is this the leak? What is it that we do as this the leak? Now, this leak was founded in 2007 by MD Gert Bosman. Gert's a mechanical, uh, mechanical engineer by training. Back then it was illegal to distill at home in South Africa. And he wanted to see, but can he turn his hobby into a business? And he got some lawyers involved, they looked at the law, they wanted to see what is possible and what isn't possible. And what they found out is that although home distilling in South Africa is illegal in terms of the Liquor Act, in terms of the Excise Act, if you are registered as Article 116 manufacturer, you are legally allowed to distill at home for own use, you're not allowed to, dis uh, to sell the product, but you can distill for yourself. He also identified three challenges at that point in time for home and craft distillers in South Africa. The first one was lack of knowledge. People didn't know how to do this. There was no training available in South Africa for, um, for distilling. Um, even if you look at your winemakers, in their two, three years of study, they spent about a week on um, distilling. And for Elsenburg uh, Agricultural College specifically, until we took over their training, that was distill coming and doing a talk for a week about what distill does. No real training was available. So the knowledge wasn't available in South Africa. Second challenge was lack of access to the equipment and consumables. You could find stuff for the wine industry and more recently for the beer industry, but nothing was available for distilling. And the last challenge was support. There was none. If you had a problem, if you had a challenge, if you got some kind of issue or question regarding distilling, nobody was able or willing to help you. So Distillique was founded to overcome these three challenges. And we do that by building the following pyramid. We call it a pyramid of services. Now, at the base of this perm a permit, the foundation of everything this league does is creating awareness. Now, we create awareness through functions, through events, through lectures, through um, displays, through exhibitions, all kinds of festivals and so on. We create awareness amongst individuals to let them know that, A, they can legally distill at home, that it is legal if done properly, if you have the right pipe to work, you can legally distill at home, and B, you can start a commercial craft distillery, and we will help you do it. This is what we do with the creating of awareness. Once we've created that awareness, then we move over to the second phase, of the second level of the permit, which is training. Now, our primary training facility is in Centurion. Um, Unfortunately, in the video you will see some of it, but you won't see the entire um, the training facility. But it is the largest training facility of its type in the world, although it might not look like it. We've trained uh, the largest number of people in the world, over 9,000, very close to 10,000 people to date, trained from 40 different countries. That makes us the largest distillation training facility in the world in number of people trained. We're also the largest training facility in the world in terms of the number of courses that we provide. Over 38 different courses in our total uh, catalog of courses, most of them product specific but also technique specific courses. We have yeast courses, we've got yeast lab courses, we've got essential oil courses, um, there's courses in the production of bioethanol fuels and then obviously all our different product specific courses regarding gin, whiskey, 
rum and so forth and we will slowly but surely through the course of these training videos be adding on more and more videos extrapolating and covering all these different courses for you during the training facility or during the training process if you ever want to do on-site training as i said centurion is our primary training facility we also have a training facility in stellenbosch we are looking at opening up additional training facilities in durban and pe as well um, we've also been approached to open up a facility in Eastern Europe, in Georgia, um, so hopefully quite soon this league will be going international. We also took over Elsenburg Agricultural College's training uh, a couple of years ago, where we do the on-site training for their winemakers in distilling every year. Then we provide equipment and consumables for home distillers. Once you've learned how to distill, now you can apply that knowledge at home as a home or hobby distiller. Now, this leak prides itself in being a one-stop shop for this equipment and consumables. We will supply everything you need, be that equipment, be that measuring equipment, be that yeast, nutrients, even certain types of raw materials or consumables like grains and molasses we supply. Most of our clients prefer to deal with one supplier. We also try to provide a range of products and we supply in small quantities. Nothing stops you as a home distiller to buy directly from a big yeast company like Anchor or Lalamond or anything like uh, a company like that. But the minimum order levels are normally in the kgs. Now, if you buy a kg of yeast and it turns out to be the wrong yeast for the flavor profile you're trying to create or the product that you're uh, trying to create, you've now wasted a lot of money and you're stuck with all this yeast that you cannot use. We repackage and make available in small quantities, allowing the home distiller to play around, try different combinations, try different recipes, and see what works best for them. We also then provide certain types of botanicals and, like I said, all the different types of equipment, depending on the scale or type of distillation you want to do as a home distiller. When we go over to the craft distillers, again, we are a one-stop shop for craft distillers. Now, times have changed. Back when this leak started and when craft distilling in South Africa started, it was a risk. People didn't know would craft distilling or craft spirits work in South Africa. Would the South African market be willing to pay three, four, five, six hundred rand for a bottle of spirits? So people started small, limited budgets. 200,000 rand, 150,000 rand. That was the size of the initial craft distilleries we set up in this country. People started very small, tried to save as much money as possible, plastic fermentation tanks and so forth, in order to limit their risk and limit their exposure. Now times have changed. Craft distilling, craft spirits has proven itself in South Africa. There is no limit to what a South African will pay for alcohol. That is now a fact. We know this. So people are starting bigger. They're starting fancier, if I can put it like that. Copper columns, multi-column stills larger equipment, stainless steel instead of plastic, and so on and so forth. And the reason for this is that there is as much money to be made in the peripheral income streams of a craft distillery than there is in the actual spirits. Now, what do I mean by peripheral income streams? I'm referring to tours, tastings, events, using the facility as a function venue. I mean, we've had weddings in distilleries. We've had photo shoots in distilleries. We've had product launches in distilleries. We've had team building events in distilleries. People want to be in distilleries. It's cool. It's romantic. It's exciting. But then the distillery's design needs to lend itself to that. The look and feel, the the ambience, the atmosphere, the equipment must be impressive. It must be clean, it must be tidy, there must be space for people to walk around. So suddenly there's a whole bunch of new aspects to consider when you are designing your distillery. And as a result we've had to lift our game as well. It is now not uncommon for us to start off with 900,000, 1 million, 1.5 million, 2 million rand distilleries because the owners see the potential of a craft distillery being more than just an alcohol production facility. This is especially important if you follow what we normally um, uh, try to push the clients toward, is focusing on the local market initially, getting people into the distillery, selling as much as possible to the uh, consumer directly, bypassing the middleman, not paying off um, uh, profit or giving off profit and potential profit to intermediaries like distribution companies and liquor stores and so on. Because that means a lot more money in your pocket as a craft distiller. But then you need a nice looking distillery that will bring people to your premises. So we've lifted our game and we now provide a larger variety of equipment, much nicer looking uh, uh, equipment. Please note, however, just because it's nicer looking, fancier looking doesn't necessarily mean it makes a better quality product. 
still comes down to the craft of the individual running the equipment. How do they utilize that equipment? What decisions do they make in terms of the process that they're using to produce the product? So just because the equipment looks more expensive and is more expensive does not mean it's necessarily going to make a better quality product. Then we provide support for the craft distillers. And the first level of support is interacting with government, uh, which is always a lot of fun, obviously. Uh, we work a lot with SARS and the Department of Agriculture. And with SARS, we engage with them regarding excise tax and legislation regarding home distilling and commercial distilling. We've had some big successes there. Our biggest success to date was the scrapping of the minimum still size requirement. Now, this is an old holdover from the 1960s, one of the measures they put into place to stop Mampu production in South Africa, where they said you were not allowed to go commercial if your still was less than 680, uh, 680 liters in size. We got that scrapped about two years ago. Now you can go commercial with any size still. Even a five liter still you are now legally allowed to use on a commercial level. We've also had changes made there in the registration process for Article 116, as well as um, the way the VMP and VMS works, things that we'll discuss later on in some of our training videos. In terms of the Department of Agriculture, we deal with them regarding what you're allowed to make and how you're allowed to make it. The um, National Liquor Products Act is the law which governs what products we are allowed to produce in South Africa and how we must produce those products. Now, there are certain limitations in South African law, things that we're not allowed to do. For instance, we weren't allowed to barrel, uh, do barrel-aged gin. We got that changed. Now you can do barrel-aged gin. You were not allowed to add sugar to gin. We got that changed. Now you are allowed to add sugar to gin. And there's a whole lot of other projects that we're working on as well. Spice drum, for instance. Currently, that's illegal. We want to legalize that. The addition of honey to gin is illegal. We want to legalize that. So slowly but surely we're working with government to change these laws and make it more accessible to craft distillers, make more product categories accessible to the consumers. With Michelangelo Awards, we started or initiated the Craft Spirits Trophies with the Michelangelo Awards for Best Craft Rum, Best Craft Vodka, Best Craft Gin and Most Innovative Craft Spirits. Now all of these activities we do under the banner of SACTI, the Southern African Craft Distilling Institute. Now, we found it SACTI back in 2009 already, because back then we already realized there will be a point where craft distillers in South Africa needs to get organized. There's a lot of challenges that faces craft distillers in South Africa, a lot of laws that are against us, laws protecting big companies, making it difficult for small companies to enter into the liquor market. And the only way to change this is to work together, to work cooperatively to change these laws and to change these regulations. Because as one small craft distiller, your business is too small. Nobody's really going to listen to you. Nobody's going to pay attention to you. But as an organization, we represent a lot of jobs. We represent a lot of income for the government in various forms, excise tax only being one of it, uh, but also PIYE, VAT, exports, tourism. We stimulate businesses and other industries. The craft spirits industry has already led to a whole bunch of new businesses starting up in South Africa to support that industry. I'm not talking about uh, bottling companies, bottle, uh, bottle companies themselves supplying bottles and closures, label printing companies, decorative companies, all kinds of businesses that's been sp uh, started up because of craft spirits. And that is what we're trying to stimulate here. We're trying to stimulate the economics uh, growth of this country as well as the craft industry as a whole. But, as I said, we can't do that as individuals. So the role of SACTI is to represent the craft distillers as a whole. Now, SACTI has a whole lot of projects um, uh, going at the same time. One of these projects being real craft. Now, Real Craft is a spirit certification program that we've started. It's a separate entity. It operates independently. It has to operate independently. One of the things that plays a role in certification is the certification body has to be independent, separate from the producers and um, manufacturers of the alcohol products, in this case being alcohol products. So Real Craft is basically a way to communicate to the consumers when is something craft and when is it not craft. People are voting with their wallets. They're voting with their credit cards. They're voting with the money that they're spending. And the vote is going towards craft spirits. People want to know what they are buying. Currently, however, the problem is that you walk into a liquor store and you're overwhelmed with all these choices of spirits on the shelf. 
And people don't know what's craft and what's not craft. Because, unfortunately, there are brands out there taking advantage of the popularity of craft and the high profit margins on craft. If you are a commercial producer, um, large-scale producer, there is a huge profit margin um, if you are playing, playing in, in the craft sphere. For a craft distiller doing actual small-scale production, the profit margin is not that big. But if a commercial company or a mega or what we call a national liquor manufacturer were to play in that market space and sell for the same uh, profit margin or the same pricing, they make a lot more profit. The challenge comes in how do we educate the consumers? How do we tell them when something is craft and when it is not craft? So that is what Real Craft uh, uh, tries to do, is to communicate that. So if you ever see the Real Craft sticker on a bottle, you can know and rest assured that that product is a craft product. It has been audited, it has been independently verified, and it complies to the regulations of craft as voted on by the SACTI members at the inaugural SACTI conference. There is a meaning to craft. The last step of the pyramid, at the very top of our pyramid of services, is research and development. Now, with research and development, we continuously expand on the services that we provide, not only on training courses, but also the physical equipment, the support services, and so forth that we provide to keep our distillers, to keep our clients, to keep the industry at the cutting edge of technological innovation and advancement, both in terms of the consumables, enzymes, yeast, and so forth, but also in the equipment and processes that they use. In the end, this league has one simple goal. It's been always been our goal. To have a craft distillery in every town in South Africa. Now, back in 2009, 2010, people laughed at us when we said this. We're not laughing anymore. This league is set up by over 114 craft distilleries in more than 16 countries worldwide, and we're continuously adding more and more craft distilleries to this. We want to bring back choice. People like to think that now in modern times we've reached the apex of choice, that we are spoiled for choice, but we're not spoiled for choice. Go into any bar in the world, be it Cape Town, be it Durban, be it Pretoria, be it London, be it uh, New York, be it San Francisco, be it Tokyo, be it Sydney. You walk into the bar, what do you see on the shelf? The same products lined up in every single bar in the world. Not too long ago, 30, 40 years ago, you'd walk into a small little town like Riversdale or... Uh, Still Bay or wherever in South Africa, you would walk into there in a little bar or a little restaurant and you would see bottles on the shelves that you would find nowhere else in the world because it was made there, it was made locally. Today that's not the case anymore. Craft looks to bring that back, bring back the uniqueness, bring back the locality, bring back the choice to the consumer. That is what we strive to do. And that is what we here at this league will help you do through these training videos and training courses. So we hope you enjoy it. We hope you're going to learn something. And we hope to taste your products in the near future.